Hi everyone, uh, my name is Owen Johnston, I'm Partnerships Manager at the Modern Slavery PEC. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. We're still expecting a few more people, but uh, it's three minutes past, so I think we'll get started and people can join as we go. So thanks so much for being with us. Um, just before we get going, I'm just going to take you through a few housekeeping points uh, and then hand over to my colleagues to begin uh, presenting. Uh, so if you're happy to do so, um, it would be fantastic if you could make sure your display name includes your name and your organisation. Just helps us know who we're talking to and who we've got on the call. And there are instructions on how to do that in the chat for this call uh, if you haven't done that before. Also, if you're happy to do so, uh, we love to see people's faces, so please do turn your camera on if you're comfortable doing that. It makes the call a bit more interactive. Um, as we go through, there are two parts to this webinar. The first part where we're speaking and the second part will be the Q&A section. Do feel free to ask questions at any time using the chat function. We'll come to all of those questions in the second half of the webinar, um, but, but feel free to pop them in as they occur. If you have any technical problems as well, please also post that in the chat. Uh, if it's within our ability to do so, we'll do our very best to fix that for you. And just finally to note before we begin that we are recording this webinar and we will be sharing it online afterwards for anyone who isn't able to make this slot, but we won't include the Q&A uh, when we share that recording. So the agenda for today, first 45 minutes will be the present. Owen, just to jump in, I think you went on mute as you started to introduce the agenda. Sorry about that. Uh, so the agenda is in two parts. Uh, the first part will introduce the Modern Slavery PEC. We'll provide an overview of the research call. Then we'll go through in detail the application process and also ways of working with the uh, successful researcher or research team. And then in the second half, we'll open it up to a Q&A uh, for any, any questions that you might have. Okay, so I'm now gonna hand over for an introduction to the Modern Slavery PEC and an overview of how we fund research to Professor Alex Belch, who is Director of Research. Sorry, Professor Alex Belch, who is Director of Research at the Modern Slavery PEC. Over to you, Alex. Thanks, Owen. Uh, and uh, yeah, welcome everyone. Um, thanks for coming to this uh, event today. Yeah, so as Owen said, I'm uh, Alex Balch, I'm a professor of politics at the University of Liverpool, uh, and I'm uh, director of research at the Modern Slavery PEC. And um, I'm just going to take you through um, some of the sort of key parts of this call, but starting off with um, uh, what is the, uh, the Modern Slavery PEC? Who are we? So if you can just go to the next slide, please, Owen. So we are um, a consortium of six uh, research institutes. Um, we, we, we have got some funding for the next few years until April 2024, and that's £10 million, which is an exciting opportunity for us to, to really um, you know, improve the quality of research in this area, uh, but also to, to really target some of those gaps in knowledge and evidence to, um, to improve our understanding of, of modern slavery, but also to transform the effectiveness uh, of laws and policies. So we're all about um, the two, two ends of, of that are to improve the sort of production of, uh, of, of evidence, but also to improve how that evidence is used uh, by policymakers. Uh, next slide, please. So we are six uh, institutes, as I, as I mentioned, so I'll just very quickly run through them. Um, based at the Bingham Centre for the Rule of Law, which is actually part of Bickle, British Institute for International and Comparative Law. Uh, the other five uh, partners are uh, the Bonavera Institute for Human Rights, which is based at Oxford University, the Alan Turing Institute, Centre for the Study of International Slavery, which is at University of Liverpool, um, the uh, Wilberforce Institute at the University of Hull, and the Rights Lab at the University of Nottingham. So um, just to round off this sort of, um, you know, 
how the PEC is constituted. We are funded through uh, UKRI, so you know um, research and innovation, but we are sort of uh, our sort of host funder is the AHRC, supported by the ESRC, so it's sort of a joint effort. Um, and so when we do uh, open calls. Um, we do those through the AHRC and the standard system, which is uh, the JES form. And um, I think many of you here will be aware of that sort of standard process for uh, open calls. But this, what we're going to talk about today, is a, is a more targeted uh, uh, and a, a more specific call for research. Um, next slide, please. So what do we do at the PEC? We, um, We've done a number of things already. We're already uh, 18 months, two years in to our uh, funding window at the moment. And we've uh, already run a um, consultation on what are the gaps, uh, what are the big areas that we need to do more research on. So the point there is to um, co-develop that research agenda. And that means working with stakeholders. Uh, and we regularly meet with key stakeholders to ask them what they believe are the key areas where research is needed. Um, so we're, we're about co-development and collaboration. Now, that's not um, uh, a simple thing. It's something we have to keep working on. We're about building trust between the research community and policymakers, where sometimes there can be misunderstandings, there can be difficulties in translating research findings. Uh, making those research findings more accessible uh, for decision makers. Um, and, you know, that's a, that's a very big part of what we do. Uh, it's quite, uh, quite, quite intensive and it's quite, uh, it's quite challenging because um, researchers are very keen to talk about their findings and their results in great detail, but policymakers sometimes don't have that length of time to read long, lengthy reports. So we do need to try and translate our work uh, into what is more sort of accessible uh, for decision makers. Uh, but we're also interested in widening out the research um, field itself and bringing in uh, knowledge from other related disciplines, um, particularly around uh, the effectiveness of policies, the effectiveness of, um, of different approaches, where we think that there could be value in learning from uh, related disciplines and sectors and bringing that information, that knowledge to, to bear on um, on the question of how you deal with modern slavery. And I think that's something that is part of this call that we are interested in, um, you know, obviously subject specific knowledge and experience, um, but also with the possibility of um, new perspectives, new disciplines. Uh, and alongside that, the importance of those with lived experience uh, being involved in all aspects and in all parts of the research process. So when you devise what research should be done uh, right through to how it's conducted, and of course, um, you know, prioritizing those people who you are expecting to benefit from the research and including them in all parts of dissemination and uptake as well. Uh, so we're doing that in a number of ways, which we can get to in the q and A, I I think. Um, but uh, obviously, one thing we're doing today is, is convening events. Uh, we do uh, anticipate running more events in the future where we'll bring researchers together to talk about specific methods, specific new techniques, um, but also to help um, researchers to connect with policymakers, where we know there can be sometimes a bit of a divide, a bit of a gap. And uh, that's something that the PEC is here to, to improve. Um, so next slide, please. So um, one of the outcomes of our research consultation was um, the identification of sort of three guiding principles that we're gonna run through all of our research. So that includes the open calls uh, and through to these smaller, um, more targeted research pieces, which is what we're talking about today. And those are very straightforward. They are uh, a, a need for research to help us understand what is effective, how we can be more effective in the way we address modern slavery. So that sort of often summarizes what works. But I think um, just that idea that we need to understand what is effective, what is not effective. Um, equitable 
uh, outcomes, uh, the importance that we engage with more structural inequalities in terms of how we uh, prioritize our research and the messages that we give to policymakers about the wider impacts in society of particular interventions which may have unintended consequences that may disadvantage certain groups. Uh, and then finally, as I was just speaking about on the previous slides, survivor involvement and the importance of including that not just as uh, a tokenistic uh, inclusion of uh, a survivor perspective at, at a certain point in the research process, but actually incorporating it within design, conducting and disseminating research so that we actually have leadership from those with lived experience. Um, next slide, please. So um, here we get to the sort of nitty gritty. Um, how do we fund research? And this obviously relates very much to the topic for today, which is um, the targeted research um, on prevention. So we have three ways that we deliver new evidence um, in this space. The first one is the open research calls, which I've already mentioned. And um, these are the most familiar types of um, research funding process in the academic world. These are uh, managed by uh, our funding uh, host, which is the Arts and Humanities Research Council. You use the joint electronic submission system, which is JES, and you submit a really quite lengthy uh, and quite um, quite detailed and uh, multiple part um, uh, research proposal. Um, now that has its place and we, we, we are um, devoting a large part of our funding to those open calls, but obviously by their very nature, they are open and we cannot predict um, what sort of research proposals will arrive. Uh, we obviously encourage as many people as possible to submit open calls, but we don't actually have an open call at the moment. Uh, we've just finished um, our last one, which was on support for victims and survivors. Uh, and we will be, the, the results of that will be announced very shortly. Um, so they uh, allow us to do longer term research uh, that is more um, open to um, large uh, research teams to apply, um, to um, develop their own uh, agenda, their own um, uh, priorities. And we then select the best quality um, calls uh, best quality proposals that we receive. So obviously that has advantages and disadvantages in terms of aligning with our priorities or with the priorities of stakeholders and policymakers. But we like the fact that we have a balance where some of our research is uh, is just open for uh, any proposals, and others are more managed and more uh, more closely aligned with um, the needs of policymakers and stakeholders. So the second way we produce research and evidence is through our partners, our six, um, the six members of our consortium. And they each have a, um, a PEC fellow, uh, normally a postdoctoral research fellow, who works on um, developing evidence reviews and policy briefs for us uh, and in collaboration with us. So each of the institutes that I mentioned earlier has got a particular area that they're interested in normally related to their particular strengths so obviously the Turing Institute has something that's very much focused on the potential for AI and data science um, and um, and that is ongoing and is more about um, producing the foundation the, the the evidence reviews that then uh, highlight and identify the gaps that other research can then um, address. The third and final one, and the one we're focusing on today, is responsive research. And this is targeted time-sensitive research, uh, where we've been asked for evidence by stakeholders. We then have a, a system for, um, for assessing whether that request uh, and that suggestion for research is a good one, and it, whether it, it warrants new research to be undertaken, or whether indeed the research already exists and all we need to do is um, maybe a, an evidence review. So where we've uh, spoken to our stakeholders and we've, uh, we've received a, a suggestion for research, which we think is, is worthy of new research, then we will design a 
a responsive research call. And that's what uh, this is about today. So um, this is, you know, by its very nature, it's time sensitive. It's often quite a quick turnaround. Um, and it's quite specific because we're trying to address a specific gap. And it contrasts, if you like, with the open research calls where we do not, um, um, you know, we do, we do not require certain particular questions to be addressed. Uh, we, we, we specify a broad area, but with the responsive research, we're specifying very particular uh, uh, evidence needs that uh, we would like researchers to, uh, to help us with. Um, next slide, please. So um, just to um, talk about the, the general um, priorities of the modern slavery PEC, we have four main areas. And uh, if you want to visit our website and look at the consultation, you'll see that we've identified particular priorities in each of these. Um, so the first one is, is prevention, the second is survivor support, third is supply chains, and the fourth is effectiveness of legal enforcement. So what we're doing is in our program of those different um, mechanisms of funding research, we are trying to um, address all the priorities um, when it's most appropriate to do so. It's not, it's a bit of a balancing act where we in parallel have open calls for longer term research and then we uh, complement them with, with shorter term targeted uh, responsive research calls. <clears throat> and an example of that is um, a call that we put out um, last year on the impact of COVID-19. So um, that was a sort of uh, a responsive um, approach that we took because of the pandemic, which was not, you know, um, expected or predicted when the when the PEC was set up. Uh, we decided it was worthwhile having a an open call um, to um, address this as an emerging and cross cutting issue. So we don't ever count out the possibility of sort of um, changing. Uh, and responding to emerging priorities. Uh, and COVID-19 is a good example of that. And our projects on COVID-19 are um, just finishing now. And you'll be, um, if, you, if you join our mailing list, you'll be able to, um, uh, to listen and learn about all the new projects that have been completed on the impact of COVID-19 on modern slavery. Uh, next slide, please. I think, um, Owen, I can now pass back to you and uh, move to the next section. Thanks. Thanks so much, Alex. Um, so we're now going to move on to talking about this particular research call and an introduction to that, which I'm going to hand over to Olivia Hesketh, who is our Director of Policy Impact. Over to you, Olivia. Thanks very much, Owen. And um, hi, everyone. My name is Olivia Hesketh. Um, as Owen said, I'm Director of Policy Impact. Um, at the Modern Slavery PEC. Uh, in my previous role, I worked in the Home Office in the Modern Slavery Unit. So really coming at this topic from the perspective of somebody who's been a policymaker in this area and really thinking about how to make the best use of evidence uh, to inform policy decisions. So I wanted to spend a few minutes just talking about the background and the rationale for this particular research call that the PEC has put out on prevention. So this is really focused on the priority area for the PEC on prevention of modern slavery. And we know from the research consultation that we undertook last year that there's a real desire within the stakeholder community to understand more about what is effective in terms of preventing modern slavery, which interventions, activities are going to have an effect in terms of uh, stopping this crime before it starts. But we also know that there is very limited evidence out there on what is effective and what works in prevention of modern slavery. We know from existing research that very few interventions which have been delivered have been subject to impact evaluation, which is the kind of gold standard for really giving definitive evidence on what works. However, we know that there is lots of appetite from funders, from policymakers, from practitioners to do more in the world of prevention and a real need to understand what looks promising in terms of prevention, which interventions have the highest potential 
to prevent modern slavery. And that's really what this call is about. It's about trying to understand in a world of um, limited resources, how can we provide policymakers and funders and practitioners based on the available evidence? How can we provide them information about which interventions are likely to have um, the greatest potential in terms of preventing modern slavery? We know that um, when we talk about interventions to prevent modern slavery, that covers a really wide range of different types of activities. So interventions which have been delivered by a range of partners, including government, NGOs, and civil society, include um, things like awareness raising campaigns, education initiatives, um, civil orders to prevent offending and reoffending. There's a whole range of different things which can be captured under the prevention interventions banner. And with this research, we're interested in looking across the whole spectrum and looking at not only interventions which aim to prevent victimization and look at um, protecting vulnerable individuals, but also interventions which are focused on preventing offending and deterring potential offenders from engaging in modern slavery. One of the key priorities for the modern slavery decisions which are being made by policymakers and um, We've identified a number of opportunities through which we want to use the findings from this research to inform ongoing policy considerations and influence those. So, for example, we know at the moment that the government is undertaking a review of the 2014 modern slavery strategy, and we would really like to use the findings from this research to inform um, the thinking that goes into that in terms of the role of prevention in that wider strategic approach to modern slavery. We also know that the Home Office has ongoing considerations around establishing a new modern slavery prevention fund. And again, we hope that the findings from a piece of research like this one will really provide a strong evidence base on where, uh, in terms of investment, um, funding has the greatest potential to prevent modern slavery. So with that in mind, I'm going to hand back to Alex, who's going to talk in a little bit more detail about the specific objectives of this call. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Olivia. Um, so, um, yeah, so the main um, objectives here for this programme are to um, assess those programmes and activities that are uh, trying to prevent modern slavery in the UK. So we're aware that um, um, it's not possible to always find a, you know, randomised control trial uh, in this area. This is not where we're expecting the research to go it's it's um it's much more difficult actually to assess programs and activities because a lot of them are quite small scale they might be undertaken by local authorities or um ngos and might therefore be um quite difficult to um access and difficult to assess so it's all about providing a thorough and rigorous assessment of those programs and activities while doing that we're really keen that the successful applicant has a focus on um, the guiding principles that I mentioned earlier, which is you know, effectiveness, but also equity and survivor involvement. So uh, that means you know, building those sort of issues into that assessment uh, and considering implementation and lessons from other policy areas. Apologies for the... Uh... <laughs> it's still school holidays here. Um, so, um, a successful applicant would collaborate with us, uh, and this would be seen as a more cooperative grant. So we would obviously welcome the, um, the, 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 the proposals that come to us, but the successful applicant would be expected to work with us to then finalise and develop the methodology and uh, to, uh, to work with us together collaboratively across the piece. Um, just finally, just to mention that you know, we're looking at assessment of programs and activities to prevent modern slavery. We're fully aware that uh, broader legal and policy frameworks are very important here. For example, uh, the way the labor market is regulated, the way the immigration system is run. And we are not saying that those are irrelevant to the question, but just this particular piece of research uh, is not uh, intended to address those. It may well be that the, the PEC will uh, seek to look at those broader legal and policy frameworks through another of its mechanisms. But this is a shorter term 
uh, more tightly focused piece of work that is looking at those programs and activities that are actually explicitly aiming to prevent modern slavery. So those other broader policy frameworks, which we know are very important, uh, are out of scope for this particular um, piece of work. Um, next slide, please. Uh, I think, are we moving on to Kelly next? I'm going to talk to this slide very briefly. Um, so I just wanted, we wanted to highlight some advice for making a strong bid. And um, I really wanted to emphasize certain parts of the call documentation. Um, so all of the points here are included in the documentation, but just to um, spell them out a little bit more. Um, so what we are really interested in is bids that propose a really robust um, mixed methods research design. And also that the bids are really clear about how they will build on existing research in this area so that the research is making a novel contribution to the evidence base. We are also really keen to see ideas and proposals for the inclusion and exclusion criteria. So broadly speaking, this means how does the research propose to define the programs and, intervent the programs and activities which will be classed as prevention interventions for the purposes of this research? As Alex mentioned, that's something we'd really look to refine um, with the successful applicant, but we're really interested in seeing some strong ideas for that at bid stage as well. We also really interested in seeing bids which have a really clear and well thought through pathway for including the perspective and voice of survivors in the research design and the research uh, methodology and uptake. And also we really welcome um, ideas uh, for how the research proposes to grade interventions. We've spoken about how this is really focused on looking at the potential of interventions to prevent modern slavery. We in the call documentation have specified that we would really like the research to be able to grade interventions according to having high, medium or low potential to prevent modern slavery and really robust ideas as to the analytical framework that will support that grading system uh, would be really welcome as well. And then finally, one thing to emphasize is that as part of the uh, research, we'd really welcome uh, ideas and proposals for really innovative ways to visualize and prevent present the findings. We know that this um, is quite a multifaceted uh, project. As I mentioned earlier, there's lots of different types of activities and programs uh, which are focused on prevention. There's also lots of different types of modern slavery. Uh, and we're interested in the research looking at the interventions alongside the different types of modern slavery as well. So we'd really welcome ideas for ways of presenting findings in a, a really visual, compelling way. And that will also assist with uh, translation of this research and making it accessible uh, to policymakers and decision makers as well. Thanks. I'll hand back to you now, Owen. Thanks very much, Olivia. Um, so we're now going to move on to the details of the application process itself. Uh, and I'm going to hand over to Kelly Ryan, who is our operations director. Thanks, Kelly. Great. Thanks very much, Owen. Uh, nice to meet you all today. Thanks for being here. Um, as Owen said, I'm the operations director at the Modern Slavery PEC, and I've been working in research management in a university and or independent research organisation background for around a decade now. Uh, so I have a little bit of experience of, of working with research funding calls. Um, next slide, please. So to start this section on the application process, I'm just going to run through the timelines. And here on this slide, you can see a few key dates. The dates above the black line are the dates relevant to the application and the award process. So the deadline for receipt of applications through our online form is the 18th um, of June at 4 p.m. And at this point, the app application form will close and it won't be possible to submit to us after this time. So please do ensure that any relevant research admin colleagues are aware of your deadlines and that you leave enough time for it to go through any approval processes at your lead institution. Um, after the deadline, so uh, between the 21st of June and 2nd of July, we'll be reviewing the applications by an expert assessment panel and we'll have decisions communicated to all of the teams by week commencing the 5th of July. 
We expect the successful project teams to start no later than the 15th of July. And after the award starts, there'll be several touch points until the project ends between the successful team and our team here at the Modern Slavery PEC. Um, as, as we've mentioned in the core documentation and here today, the outputs will be co-produced in collaboration with us. So we recommend that you build in plenty of time into your work plan for that collaboration. Um, I also just wanted to follow up on some contacts that I've had behind the scenes for some emails that I've received from prospective applicants. Um, some people have asked for early sight of the award documentation, given that there's quite a tight turnaround between the award notification and the project start date. So I just wanted to let you all know that we're working to finalise that award documentation as soon as possible, and I'll post it on the project web page as soon as I can. So please, uh, sorry, the call web page. So please do keep an eye out for that. Next slide, please. I'm just going to run through um, the overarching eligibility criteria here for the call. Um, as Alex mentioned earlier on, the Modern Slavery PEC is funded by UKRI, predominantly by AHRC with support from ESRC. And as our funding comes from AHRC, the eligibility criteria for this call are largely in line with the standard AHRC expectations. Um, projects should be led by a university or an independent research organization. And if you want to get any clarity on whether you're eligible or whether your collaborating organization is, is eligible to lead, um, you can have a look on page seven of the call documentation. There is a footnote there with a link that will give you more information um, on, on eligibility um, on lead institutions. Um, so as we've mentioned, one of the key things that we want to do as a centre is to facilitate communication and collaboration across disciplines and sectors. And so for projects to be eligible, we also ask that they're collaborative. And as well as involving a university or research organization, we ask that at least one UK-based third sector organization is involved in your research project. In terms of how many applications you can be involved in, um, we ask the academic uh, principal investi investigators or co-investigators -investi are only involved in one application submission but we're not putting any limit on the number of applications that a third sector organization uh, can collaborate on. Um, also, given the nature of this very particular call, international collaborations are not eligible, but I did want to mention that this doesn't mean that for future calls, um, international collaborations won't be eligible, just for this specific call. Next slide, please. So in terms of what funding is available, we have allocated a maximum budget of £70,000 at 100% for economic cost for this particular call. Um, in line with the usual AHRC funding rules, universities and ind independent research organisations will be funded at 80% for economic cost, and third sector organisations will receive 100% of their cost. But their budget must not account for more than 30% of the total project cost. And this percentage, this 30% is a combined total. So for example, if there are two third sector organizations taking part in a project, their total costs when added together must not be more than 30% of the total project budget. And again, this is something that's in line with standard AHRC regulations. Um, I have received some questions via email about whether directly allocated costs are eligible. So I just wanted to clarify here that even though we can't fund directly allocated costs for PIs and COIs, we do accept PI and COI costs to be included as directly incurred, which is a little bit different from normal AHRC rules. Um, I'm happy to take questions on that via email. Um, or questions towards the end um, on that, if, if you would like. Um, I just wanted to say as well that I'm conscious that some of what I've said might sound quite jargony, and especially to some of those of you who are not working in higher education or research organisations, but the good news is, is that if it does feel quite jargony, um, you probably don't need to worry about those technical terms as these relate only to the universities and the independent research organisations. Next slide, please. 
So I'm conscious that the, um, the funding rules can seem quite complicated and I wanted to put together some visual examples um, to help you get an idea of what that funding split might look like in reality. There are a couple of scenarios here and these scenarios are also available on the core page on our website if you want to take a look at them later on. Um, so here in scenario one, it's a simple project involving one university and one third sector organization. The total project budget combined, um, combined comes to the maximum 70,000 and the third sector budget is 21,000, which is 30% of the total project budget. And you can also see here, if you, if you go across the, um, the table that the third sector organization gets 100% of the award whilst the university will only receive 80% of the award in line with standard AHRC rules. Um, in the second example here, uh, we have a slightly more complicated project. We've got two universities and two third sector organizations collaborating. And this project has a slightly smaller so, uh, total project budget of 60,000. And when looking at the figures for the third sector organization, organizations, you'll see that when they're combined, their total costs equal 30%. So that's the 8% and the 22% just there. Um, and as I said, I, I'm happy to take any questions on this at the end during the Q&A session. Uh, next slide, please, Erin. I'm just going to run through a little bit more detail on how we're assessing applications. So as I've mentioned, um, submissions can be accepted through until 4 p.m. on the 18th of June and the system will close at that time. So I'll say it again, please make sure that you push the button and submit your application before then. Um, otherwise, we won't be able to accept the application. Um, Teams are asked to submit four key pieces of documentation, which will be um, assessed by the panel. There's a project narrative, an ethics statement, a budget table, and a justification of resources. Um, each of these se sections have been given assessment weightings. These weightings are available on the core documentation and can guide you as applicants on how we'll be scoring uh, the project. Um, once applications are received after the closing date, we will be reviewing um, them and making decisions through an assessment panel, which will be convened by us, and it will include expert independent reviewers from outside of the centre. Um, as I mentioned in my earlier timeline slide, we aim to communicate decisions by 5th of July and for projects to start no later than the 15th of July. Um, I believe that this is the end of my section, so I'm going to hand back over to you, Owen. Thanks very much, Kelly. Um, so we're now just going to briefly talk about actually conducting the research and how we would expect to work with the successful applicant. And for that, I'm going to hand back to uh, Liz Williams, who is our policy impact manager, and Jakob Sobek, who is our communications director. And Liz, thank you. Thanks, Owen. Nice to meet you all. Um, as Owen said, I'm Liz Williams. I'm the policy impact manager at the PEC. Um, and as Alex mentioned earlier, collaboration and cooperation are really core values for us um, at the PEC, and they guide our ways of working with uh, research teams. So we in the core Modern Slavery PEC team will work jointly with a successful team, really from the outset of the project, um, but all the way through the, the life of the project. So the expected team, um, the successful team will be expected to develop a methodology in collaboration with the PEC and also to co-produce project outputs. Um, we will provide a guide to the successful team on what to expect when working with us in the PEC. Um, we'll agree regular touch points throughout the project and co-create a timeline. So that will set out sharing draft outputs um, and time built in for PEC to provide feedback um, on those outputs. I'll now pass on to Jakob, our communications director. Uh, hi, my name is Jakob Sovig. I'm a communications director of the PEC and just wanted to touch briefly on, uh, on how the work on the actual outputs uh, is going to look like. 
uh, in terms of ownership and branding and how we're going to work uh, on this. Um, the first thing to say is the, the data sets uh, created in the project will remain the property of the, uh, of the, of the team. Um, in terms of the, the uh, final outputs, um, we expect to uh, produce kind of two things. Uh, one is the this going to you know, this going to be like a full report, um, which uh, depending on on the successful team's preference could be co-branded or pack branded. Uh, uh, I know some people are, uh, are keen on, on using their own university branding, for example. Uh, uh, so that that uh, we fairly flexible with that. That's something that we can discuss at the beginning of the project. Uh, but the uh, the other uh, output that we're going to work on is is what we call research summary, which is uh, which is our kind of uh, pack branded product that uh, we're going to publish on the on the uh, on the pack website. And that's something that's just a, essentially a summary that's focused on key findings and key recommendations that's got uh, a policy uh, kind of at the forefront uh, of it. Uh, so this is the both, uh, and this is going to be pack branded. Uh, I provided a, an example of uh, what it's uh, of what the, one of our research summaries uh, cover. Uh, look like uh, there are more examples on our website. Feel free to, to go through them. Uh, and uh, the final report, uh, the teams are free, free to use uh, after the end date uh, of the project uh, uh, for their own use. Uh, and just to uh, reiterate the, the earlier um, messages that uh, close collaboration is, is something that is uh, very important to us and we uh, will be uh, kind of expecting the successful teams to uh, work very closely on us uh, on communications from the start and including uh, like rounds of uh, feedback and, and working together on producing uh, the final outputs both in terms of the uh, final full report the research summary but also the all the kind of uh, uh, public communications around it so potential uh, press releases, uh, talking to, to the media, uh, social media, things like that. Uh, we expect to work quite closely uh, on these things. Thank you.